Mr. Chairman, and thank you for calling this hearing. Let me say uh, to all of the Inspector Generals and the staff here today, I want to thank you. But I, as I, the Chairman was talking, I, I thought it would be appropriate that I share with you a question that has come to me over and over and over again. And the question is, is, what, is when some of these issues came up, um, people have asked me about the Inspector Generals. They say, um, do you trust the Inspector Generals? And I say, yes. But the other question they ask is, well, if the Inspector Generals were replaced, how would you feel about that? I said, first of all, the people who hold these positions are people who are independent. And if they felt that they could not be independent, they would not take the positions. And so I would feel comfortable with our Inspector Generals, and I, and I want to thank you. I echo the words of the Chairman. We trust you. We believe in you. We thank you. We realize that so many of you could be doing so many other jobs, probably making a lot more money but you are doing the job that feeds your souls. And so we thank you. You do an extraordinary job. And we in Congress rely on you for exactly these reasons. The title of today's hearing is Empowering Inspector Generals. Our committee has acted in a bipartisan manner under both Democratic and Republican leadership to promote the critical work of IGs. For example, on December 16, 2016, President Obama signed into law the Bipartisan Inspector General Empowerment Act of 2016. However, one thing that disempowers Inspector Generals is when they are threatened, threatened with retaliation for reporting waste, fraud, and abuse, <coughs> or even worse, threatened with termination. When that happens, it's up to this committee to step in, investigate, and protect our IGs. Yesterday, I sent a letter along with Vice Ranking Member of this committee, Mr. Connolly, to the White House, Counsel Don McGahn. I raised concerns about the disturbing reports that Trump officials threatened to remove numerous, numerous inspector generals after the inauguration. This all started on Friday, January 13. The Trump team officials assigned to various federal agencies called to inform their respective IGs that their positions were only, and I quote, temporary, end of quote. They also reportedly informed several IGs that they should begin looking for other employment. The inspectors generals who were concerned about these uh, anonymous calls, anonymous calls uh, immediately began contacting leaders of their organizing body, the Council of Inspectors General uh, on Integrity and Efficiency. As we understand it, after urgent calls all over the weekend, some IGs were informed that higher level officials on the Trump team decided to reverse this misguided action. The IGs were told that these calls were erroneous. They were told they never should have been made. If this indeed occurred, that would be a small relief. But here is why I remain concerned. You know, a lot of people say, you know, we ought to cross that bridge when we get to it. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, we're at the bridge. We have now obtained what we believe is the email that the Trump team sent out to their political officials assigned to the federal agencies. This email was sent after normal business hours on the evening of Friday, January 13. It directed Trump staffers to make the calls, and I quote, tonight, end of quote, in all capital letters and later in bold. They were instructed to tell the IGs that they were staying over into the Trump administration only, and I quote, on a temporary basis, end of quote. The email also references vetting the IGs, but does not explain on what basis. This email demonstrates that these calls were not isolated in incidents. These calls were not isolated incidents. 
This was a coordinated campaign to target inspectors general that someone in the Trump team planned, approved, organized, and, ex and executed across multiple agencies. The problem is that we still do not who know who. Whoever approved these calls had absolutely horrendous judgment and should not be allowed anywhere near the reins of power. We also still do not know who ultimately reversed this terrible approach. And we still have no official communication confirming that this reversal, in fact, applies to all the IGs. So yesterday, we wrote to the White House counsel asking him these questions. Most importantly, we asked for official confirmation that President Trump has no plans, has no plans to fire any IGs now that he has been sworn in. I want, I ask unanimous consent that our letter be made part of the official record, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the letter with, without objection is ordered, but I would like to see the email, which you've not shared with us, I don't believe. We did share it. We just you. gave it to you. Okay. We, we shared it with you earlier this morning. Uh, <clears throat> I also ask that the committee staff conduct a transcribed interview of the Trump official who sent this email so that we can investigate this matter. We have several of the IGs here today so we can get their accounts of what happened. At the broadest level, we want to make sure that every single inspector general has been told in no uncertain terms that their jobs are safe. Unfortunately, these actions are part of a troubling pattern of misguided and politically motivated attacks on government watchdogs, ethics experts, law enforcement officials, and career government employees. And, and as I said before, they say we should cross the bridge when we get to it, we're at the bridge. In December, the Trump team sent a questionnaire to the Energy, and listen to this. In December, the Trump team sent an, a questionnaire to the Energy Department requesting a list of all individuals who took part in international climate talks over the past five years. We're at the bridge. In January, White House Chief of uh, Staff Rice Priebus issued a veiled threat to the Director of the Office of Government Ethics that he, that he quote, ought to be careful, unquote, unquote. In his criticism of President Trump's refusal to divest himself of his corporate ownership uh, interests, the director told members of this committee, including the chairman, that this threat made him, made his, his, made him feel and his department feel, he said it was chilling, end of quote. Just last week, Trump administration officials violated multiple federal laws by imposing gag orders on the communications of federal employees, including, in some instances, communications with Congress. We're at the bridge. Within the past few days, the White House Press Secretary stated the Trump administration's official position that any State Department employees who disagree with the President's decisions should leave the government rather than voice their dissent. We're at the bridge. And on Monday, after the acting attorney general concluded that the president's executive order banning Muslims from entering the country may not be legal, the president fired her for saying, for, for saying so. What we are witnessing, ladies and gentlemen, simply is not normal. This is not normal, and we must, we must net it, never let it become normal. This is the United States of America. We have a constitution, and we must be the guardians of that constitution. And as I close, this has only been a few weeks. These actions cannot be tolerated by those of us who have, as our core mission, rooting out waste, fraud, and abuse. And this should be something that concerns all of us. Federal employees fear what is happening and what may be next to come. We will rely on our inspector generals more now than ever. There was just a, an article in the Washington Post this morning, I think it was, that talked about the many employees who are now going to inspector generals because they are afraid. And so your jobs become very, very, very significant, even more significant than they've ever been, because people see you as the last line of defense. And I hope that all of my Republican and Democratic colleagues will join together in a bipartisan manner to support our inspector generals in their mission. And let me say this, I thank the chairman 
because he has been one of the strongest uh, folks on this committee to make it clear that we will protect whistleblowers, that we will protect federal employees, that we will protect those who want to make our government the best that it can be. He has also been a strong advocate for marching forward to make sure all of us make this our great nation and more perfect union. And with that, I yield back. Mr. Chairman.